Welcome to The Business Strategist, the show that gives business owners and entrepreneurs game-changing business strategies that can be used in scaling and transforming a business. Sharing deep dive conversations with industry experts, thought leaders and clients, facing real challenges and uphill struggles. Brought to you by business strategist, former elite athlete, international speaker and best-selling author, Adam Strong. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the business show with myself, Adam Strong. I hope you're well. Um, really looking forward to today's show, ladies and gents. Um, like seriously, really looking forward to today. Um, we've actually been I've actually been speaking to our guest, his name's Scott Ritzheimer, and uh we've been speaking for probably the best part of a couple of months, but it's taken us a little while to get around to today's show. Um, just purely because of travel schedules and like dealing with business and stuff. But today is going to be absolutely epic. I'll introduce you uh, to Scott in a bit. But listen, why am I so excited about today? Well, I did say to you, um, you know, over the last couple of months, we've had a real slight change in, in direction in terms of our podcast. Um, but honestly, I swear to God, if you don't have a notebook and pen handy, stop this audio recording and go right now and get a notebook and a pen. Um, even if you're even if you're in the gym in the car right now, you're going to need to rewind this because there's going to be a lot of value bombs, a lot of golden nuggets. And I'm going to share it. Scott's going to be sharing some things with us today um, that you're going to be able to take from him and be able to implement into your own business. This is what's key. So if you're listening to us live, use the hashtag live, use the hashtag replay. This will go out on all the live streaming platforms, of course. And uh, welcome to all of our wonderful audience over on Spotify as well. Listen to a video podcast and they're so looking forward to that. So so let me introduce you uh, to our guest for today. So Scott is, the reason why Scott is here is because Scott is an absolute master at defining what the next level is. And I'm all big on the next level, right? I harp on about the next level. But he has identified one particular strategy that will help you to move in what we call a straight line. And it helps you to go from where you are to where you want to go, right? So you will probably have these aspirations, okay? But maybe there's this lack of clarity of direction, okay? And hopefully today's episode is really going to help you give you some of that clarity and just kind of like just things help things to make it a little bit clearer but scott has helped over well he's helped over just under twenty thousand businesses to start and scale uh profits and run and built and run and solid and sold his own multi-million dollar business himself before the age of 35 he's also the author of the founders evolution outlining seven different stages from pre launch to exit okay so um we if we get the opportunity we'll talk about that however i know that uh scott has a, a wonderful gift which we'll put in the show description notes that you can go check out um a little bit more of that what i'll also endorse you to do if you haven't already done so go over onto linkedin go follow scott and uh go say hi if you have any q a of course mention the podcast i'm sure him and his team will be more than kind uh to uh to respond of course so today's episode. Now I'm going to give you some context about today's episode. I'm going to give I'm going to give Scott the stage in a second. He's going to introduce himself, give us some context, but then we're going to go into role play mode, ladies and gents. We're going to use me as a guinea pig, if you like, and my business. And Scott's going to be giving. Um, he's going to give him me a mentoring consulting session, if you like. We're going to strategize, we're going to brainstorm, but he's going to help me to formulate a plan for scale, even though we're kind of not there yet. But the great thing is, is that you're going to be able to take some of the blueprint, if you like, and the same frameworks from our conversation and to implement in your own business. Anyway, without further ado, Scott, welcome to the show. Hey, Adam. I'm so excited to be here. Like you said, it's been a, a minute coming. So uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm excited that the day has finally arrived. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I mean, listen, I'm really looking forward to today. You know, you know what, you know what I love about uh, these particular sessions 
is like sometimes like I feel as a podcast host is that like, you know, when I bring in guests, right, Scott, I feel like I'm a big sponge. So I absorb a lot. It's like kind of like my way to grow personally. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But, 100%. You know what I mean? It's kind of like without having to read lots of books or listen to audio books. Not that I'm saying that that is not good because it is good. Right. But this is kind of like my, my kind of way to up my game in terms of personal growth and excellence. So anyway, sure. just wanted to kind of put it out there. Out there. Um, yeah. Looking forward to today's conversation. So, Give us give us a little bit more context because I know you sold well. You started, scaled, and sold your own business before the age of thirty five. Give us some more context around that. What was that business? And uh, yeah, t- tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so we had a business uh, helping actually launch other organizations. So we did it in both the for profit and non profit space here in the United States, uh, all across the country. And uh, this is around the time that like Google AdWords was in its heyday. Uh, we basically built a, a whole business around a couple of just slam dunk AdWords. Um, but what happened was uh, I didn't really intentionally get into it. In fact, I was actually just looking for a part time job when I bumped into uh, who was the original founder at kind of version one of this company. Uh, hmm. And you talked him into giving me a, a job, you know, part time answering emails that came into their support inbox. Uh, and at about three months later, he sold the company. Now, over the next about 18 months, I watched the, the new owners who had, um, who had an owner finance deal. So everyone's still involved uh, at this point. But the new owners systematically but unintentionally destroyed the company. Uh, it it oh, went wow. from a, a, a just it was just over a million dollars in, in annual revenue uh, all the way down to like virtual like no revenue. I mean, there was just no revenue coming in other than payments from past uh, invoices, if you will. We went from 13 wow. employees to zero. Um, and and it was it was just a, an extraordinarily painful process. And during that time, uh, I'm still one of the, the the like last people still employed by this company. And so I had an opportunity because, again, the previous uh, owner was still somewhat involved in the company to spend some time mm. with them and kind of diagnose, hey, what's going wrong here? Like and uh, and we decided if if the other company kind of threw in the towel that we'd give it another go. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. They called. They said, hey, you got 24 hours. If you want the stuff, you can come get it. But we're declaring bankruptcy. And like I mentioned earlier, there's no revenue. There's no employees really left at this time. So all the assets of the company was like three broken computers. And one of those office <laughs> chairs where like all the padding was worn out yep. where you sit, you know, so you're just sitting right on hard plastic. That's what's <laughs> left of this one really cool company, you know, not huge, but, but cool. And, uh, and so it was at that time that he, uh, he called me from the U-Haul truck and said, Hey, will you relaunch this thing? I think we can give it a go, uh, if we do it together. Mm-hmm. And so that's what we did. Now this is September, 2008, not a great time to be starting a business, uh, mm-hmm. especially a business that starts businesses. But, um, but you know, we, we did it and we really had no other choice uh, as we're, we're going to make this work or I have no idea what else we're going to do. And we did, mm-hmm. we made it work. Uh, it, it set off a growth strategy, uh, especially between the two of us and kind of our complementary skill sets. And we were doing somewhere between 30 and about 80% growth a year for, uh, for over a decade. Damn. And and that's a lot of fun. You know, it's not easy. Uh, it was hard. And being business partnerships is hard. Gr- you know, growing a business at that rate for that long is really right. hard. And and one of the biggest challenges that started to to, to pop up are around the around the eight nine year mark mm. was it, it started to not be as fun anymore. Right. Mm. It started to. I remember when I had to fire some of my best friends who are managers at the company, like leaders who had you know built this thing from nothing with us and and weren't going to get to where we, we were going to go. And I, for years, knew that that was going to happen, but I didn't actually know what I needed in their place, right? Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of leaders find themselves here as like, I know that who got me here won't get me there, but I don't know what's actually lacking. And so I don't have confidence that I could actually go out and find someone else to do it. Mm. And uh, and so 
you've got leaders that aren't really driving us forward. They're kind of holding us back. We're making bad decisions. It's not working really well. And we hit this really tumultuous season as a company. Our revenue was still growing, but our profitability was plummeting. And it went on for about three, four years. We, we could not turn it around. We went from healthy, you know, uh, 20 plus percent margins down to 7% margins. Mm, and it's like, what's wow. the point? Like, why are we doing this? <laughs> like, we are working harder than ever and making less money than we have in years. And uh, and it was in that that moment, that that kind of season of our history as an organization that I, I was actually listening to a podcast like this. And you talk about it as a, a business development tool or a, a leadership growth tool. Uh, I listened to a podcast that literally changed the trajectory, both of my life and my business. It was by a gentleman uh, actually from your side of the pond. His name is Les McEwen. He lives here in the U.S. Now he's a dear friend of mine today. Uh, but he was born and raised in Ireland. And his, to his uh, his own admission, his accent has not relocated. So I'm listening to this guy. I, I don't know if it was just the Irish accent that kept me on, but it, I think it was because he was talking about one of the most boring topics I could really think of, which was business life cycle stages. And it's like, I almost fall asleep right now just saying that. It's only nine here uh, on the East Coast, but it, it, I've had my coffee and it's still boring. But I, I listened through it. He gets to stage three and stages one and two is like, oh, yeah, like I remember those. Yeah, and and you're, as I'm listening, I'm kind of wondering, where am I going to land? You know, it's, it's the first time I ever actually felt like I was on a map somewhere. Mm. And uh, and he gets to stage three and it's like the dude's reading my my emails or he's got a camera in my office. Like I, I cannot figure out how he knows so much about our organization having never talked to us. Mm. And he's talking on a podcast. He's not even talking to me. And he outlines this stage called Whitewater and talks about how it's it's a, a stage that every organization goes through if they're successful enough to get there, right? It, it's, it's a stage where the complexity inside the organization overcomes our ability to execute. And, and that's exactly what was happening in our organization. And not only could he say, hey, this is what the stages are, he was also able to say, this is what's next, this beautiful stage called predictable success. And most powerfully, the exact steps and the exact order of those steps that you needed to do to get there. To make a really long story short, uh, I fell in love with uh, his approach to, to business. I, 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 once I understood what the game was now, how it had changed, I was able to go in and put those things in place. We tripled our bottom line in 13 months. We, mm. uh, at the same time, we actually cut a, a one and a half million dollars of revenue from our top line and made all of that up in additional revenue through the focus that we were able to bring and the organizational clarity we were able to achieve. And so transformed the business, but it also uh, helped me understand what the nature of that problem was and how if I had known it all along, I'm actually really, really good at solving those problems. I just didn't have the confidence to do it. So as I got our organization to predictable success, I was kind of thinking like, that sounds, you know, it sounds wonderful and boring. Like I, I, I need a little like something. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little crazy that way. And so uh, ultimately um, what I, I focused on at that point was building up my leadership team. And this is something I talk about with a lot of my later stage founders uh, I wanted to leave the company when it was in predictable success. I wanted to leave it when it was in its greatest point of strength so that yes. the leaders who came behind me could not only achieve the same success that I did, but actually build on it and take it to uh, yet another level of success, which they did. Uh, when I left, we were around 80, 85 employees. Um, a couple of years later, they were at 115 and growing like wildfire. So wow. really cool story. Just awesome. One of my proudest moments was that opportunity to go back and see that not only had they kept the thing floating, you know, but that they had taken it further than I ever had. Love it. When, when, uh, when Les had, it's Les, right? Yep. Yeah. When Les had gone through the business growth cycles with you, I'm sorry to say that word because I may, no, it makes you cringe. Um, what was the, what was it about the growth cycles that you thought, huh, I can relate to this stage? Like, what were the big kind of aha moments from you? This realization where you think, we are there. And now I've just realized I now know how to solve this problem. Is yeah. it was was there something from that? 
Yeah. So I would, this is this is not quite as concrete uh, as you'd like, but I'll give you a couple of very specific points here in a second. The fact, uh, the thing about it was that it actually encompassed all of the things that I was facing. So one of the things that I was I was experiencing at this stage is there were so many things wrong in so many different places. It was like a game of whack-a-mole, right? You hit one and two pop up. Uh, it was like, like I, I see the I see the ratio here. I hit one, two come up. I hit two and four come up. Like this is not going in the right direction. Um, and, and so it, it went straight to the heart of why that's happening. And, and that is for us, we were a highly sales centric organization and that is right and good. And it's how we created all the success that we created up to that point. Mm -hmm. uh, we were a, a, a heroic leadership organization, right? We'd get a couple of people in the right place and just drive them, right? Just let them rip. And, uh, and what was happening was we were running in different directions and what we didn't realize, because we never knew that there was a map to organizational growth, we we thought that the skills of the past were what we needed to move forward. And this is a common misconception for folks. The vast majority of the time someone says to me, I want to go to the next level. They don't actually want to go to the next level at all. They want more of their existing level, Right. And I was that same way. I didn't realize that a new level meant different challenges, that I had to hit mm. start over on skill sets to succeed with the skill sets that were needed in that next level. So what were the things he was talking about? He was talking about profitability. He was talking about uh, a lack of system and structure in how we make decisions. Uh, he was talking about how to assess whether the leaders that you have are the ones who got you here or the ones who are going to move you forward and do that in a concrete way. Uh, he was talking about the infighting that we were having in our leadership team because of the different leadership styles that we knew we needed, but we couldn't reconcile the differences between. Makes sense. Makes sense. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, one point that you just made there, actually, it was actually speaking with a, with a client the other day. And one thing that they, they said, they said, the one thing that is holding them back from scaling up, like really scaling them up, yeah. is this no, is this knowledge gap. Like there's this knowledge gap, right? And normally it's the reason why most people can't scale is because of the decision maker or the leader, which has not just a knowledge gap, but they've taken it as far as they can go. But you've just highlighted a really interesting epiphany. Like, you know, I just upgraded my laptop, right? I had my Apple <laughs> Mac for like nine years. It's like a historic relic, right? So I just, I just literally upgraded my MacBook Pro. So I've got this shiny brand new MacBook Pro, but it kind of performs at like 100 times more than my previous MacBook, right? So it's kind of like the same with business, right? Yeah. Yeah. Love that. Yeah, that, it absolutely is. And, uh, and again, I, I think it's a, a helpful illustration because you can you can add more ram to your macbook right uh depending right. on how you feel about the warranty you can add more space on it uh True. but the reality of it is there's still a core infrastructure that has to change right mm -hmm. if you're going to achieve that next level at some point it's going to slow down and and that laptop was exactly what you needed for nine years but you need something new and so how yeah. do we assess that how do we know when that's true right uh and that, that's what i've really given my life to since uh since selling that company very interesting very interesting it's all very very interesting I've got uh one more question actually um Actually, now I'll tell you what, well, let's, let's leave this particular question to the end because I know that, you know, you talked about decision-making quite a lot in your conversation just then. So I'd be interested to know about your, your decision-making when you had the company before you sold it and what, what the hardest thing was. But we can talk about that towards the end. Let's get into the juice of today, ladies and gents, because I know that Scott is kind of eagerly awaiting, wanting to interrogate me, of course. Well, you know what I mean. Um, so here's the context. I'm the guinea pig. Scott, me and Scott are going to jam and we're going to strategize mentorship, whatever it is. And he's going to help me. Well, I suppose he's going to, you're going to help me. You're going to help me not just with scale, but also with the leadership, right? Is that correct, Scott? Yep, yep that's right. We're going to tie it all together. All right, cool stuff, right? Well, I'm ready. I'm, well, I'm braced. I'm ready. I don't know if you guys are ready too, but make sure you got your notebooks and pens handy. So uh, I'm ready, man. Like, uh, where do we All start, right. man? 
So super cool. So to lay a little context for other folks, uh, you had an opportunity to take a couple of the assessments on our website. Uh, and so we're going to build on some of that data. We'll make that available to folks, hopefully in the show notes. Um, and and I'll, I'll explain why that's important here in a moment. But I'm going to ask you a few questions first. So the first one is uh, I'm going to I'm going to read to you seven different questions. And I want you to tell me the one that that you find yourself asking the most right now or that that really strikes home. So the first one is, you know, it, it, isn't there a better way? I wish when I wish I could quit my day job. That's probably not for you because you've been doing this for a while. But uh, if you're working somewhere else and thinking about founding a company, that's a big question. So that's question number one. Isn't there a better way? When do I get to quit my day job and start my own business? Uh, mm-hmm. Question number two is, what was I thinking? Why did I quit my day job? Uh, well, h- how am I ever going to get this thing to really work? Uh, so that's the question number two. Question number three is, what's wrong with these people? Uh, and, and these people are your employees, right? What, what's wrong with these people? All right. So mm. question number three, what's wrong with these people? Question number four, is this it? Like, is this really as uh, as far as I'm going to be able to take the business? Is, is it, Why is running a business so hard? So that's question number four. Mm. Question number five, who am I? Where do I bring value to my company and what can only I do? Mm-hmm. Question number six. Well, now what do I do? Uh, this thing isn't a full time job anymore, and golfing isn't going to cut it. What do I do now? <laughs> and last but not least, what do I want to leave behind? What's the legacy I want to leave behind? So first, in, first reaction. Which which question jumped off the page? Uh, the the I guess not a page, but what which, which one jumped out for you? <laughs> I think probably for me, especially especially from a seasoned entrepreneur perspective, is probably the last one. Um, yeah, the legacy thing. I'm really big into legacy, Scott. But, you know, I guess, yeah, I think that would probably resonate with me the most purely because yeah, I'm, I'm still trying to work that out, I think. Yeah. Fantastic. So uh, do you have a, a leadership team um, or is it is it just you? Tell me a little bit about your team. Yep. So it's mainly made up of uh, con- other consultants, right? So we've got like a, mainly content creators, graphic designers, video editors. So we've got all the content team. And then when we have particular projects, when we run our mastermind group, We'll draft in uh, some of our partners that are not necessarily employed by us, but they work alongside us. We compensate them for their work and that kind of stuff. So it is mainly that's what what our teammate is mainly made up of. Fantastic. All right. So I'm going to give you a few statements here, a few answers to this next question. So the question is, what do you spend most of your time actually doing? If you look at a normal week, which one of these do you spend most of your time on? First one, learning my trade industry uh, or testing my business plan. Uh, It's particularly true for folks that are pretty new on. Next one. So number two, selling, delivering, delivering, and adminning. I do it all. Uh, Next one (laughs) is selling or delivering. So one side or the other Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and managing my employees or team members or contractors. Okay. Uh, Next one here getting my people to work together next one Mm -hmm. leading my executive team a couple Mm -hmm. more finding and training my successor mentoring and supporting my successor so you've already selected when you're mentoring and supporting them uh Mm -hmm. or finally mentoring other visionaries and founders which one jumped out for you oh that's a tough one that's a really tough one because uh the last one, definitely, and the third one, definitely. So I don't know. It's a hard one to choose, that one. Got it. So um, you happen, because you're in that coaching space, those two uh, those two combine a little bit, but we're going to roll with a third one. Uh, okay. We're going to roll with that for now. All right, Sounds next good. one here. So in what time horizon – do you make your most of your decisions? So when you're kind of sitting down thinking through decisions, what time horizon are you using? So the first one, nights and weekends, uh, you know, I can't wait to jump in full time. Uh, <laughs> number two here, hours to days, I, I'm, you're dialed in on what needs to get done right now. That's a primary horizon that you're working on. From there, weeks to months, uh, I'm pushing the activities that we need to hit our targets for this month. 
number four, uh, quarters to years. I'm pushing to hit our goals for the entire year. And then three more, a few years. I'm looking at what needs to be done this year to have success in the next three years. Uh, decades is the second to last. I'm thinking about what I'll be doing 10 years from now and the resources we need to do it. And then legacy, I'm dreaming of what we leave behind. So when you're working, what are you spending most of your time on? I think number five, in all honesty, even though I'd love to say it was the last one. <laughs> so it was kind of like, I think what you said was years for, yeah, working on for the this year to what's going to happen in the next few years, yeah. right? Yep. Yeah. Fantastic. yeah. I think that one is probably better. Good. All right. Now, well, we spend um, uh, it's a similar question, so it sounds like there's going to be some repeat here, but I'm going to ask a slightly different way. So what are you focusing on most right now? What are you focusing on most right now? Uh, are you focusing on figuring out if your business idea will work? Hopefully not. Uh, I think we're a little no. further than that. Uh, we're, are you focusing on getting better at selling or marketing uh, and getting the job done so things don't pile up? Next one here, number three, are, are you focusing on managing your small team of employees and scaling client or customer acquisition? Number four, we're building and leading a strong uh, leadership team or negotiating the biggest deals. Number five, you're focusing on your executive team and the handful of really important strategic choices you need to make. Number six, mentoring and supporting your successor or Number seven, solving the biggest challenges facing your industry. Ooh, that's a toughie, that one. Um, I think what stands out for me is number seven. But then it was be closely related to number three as well. Got <laughs> so it. It's very Got similar it. to the other question as well, right? <laughs> yep. 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 Okay, good. Uh, so which of the following is the most true for your vision for the future of your company? Mm -hmm. Which is the most true of your vision for the future? So statement number one, I have a clear and unfulfilled vision and I have the energy to pursue it. Uh, there's a, another one here. I know what I want, but I don't know if it'll work. Again, hopefully we're beyond that one. Uh, I have a clear and unfulfilled vision, but I don't have the resources to make it happen. Uh, next one. I think growth is simple. We just need to do more of what we're already doing. Next one. I have a clear and unfulfilled vision, but I think someone else is better suited to making it happen. Or last but not least, I've handed off the vision to someone else. I actually think the first one was probably more 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 what we are aligned to got it all right we are on the home stretch here i'm going to ask you a series of uh i'm going to list a series of milestones and you tell me if you've done it or not so first one came up with a brilliant idea for your business to start it uh from from nothing i hope so <laughs> i hope so too i uh, actually went out and started it yes yep. uh, hired five or more employees or equivalents yep uh, hired and promoted a COO or other number two to help you lead the organization? Not yet. Okay. Built an executive team? Mm, I wouldn't say so. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, no CEO. Retired from the business? No, you're still actively there. Um, all right. There's a couple more, but those won't apply either based on the what you've got so far. All right. Mm. So you ready for this? Go for it. All right, here's, uh, I'm going to give you two pieces of information around this. Now, what, what all this was for is to find out, hey, what stage are you in as a founder? What stage mm -hmm. uh, in your own personal journey, like you mentioned before, from pre-launch to post-exit, what stage are you in? There's seven different stages. And one of the challenges that we face, uh, especially as founders, one of the things that stalls out founders the most is if we get caught trying to fight in multiple stages at any one given point in time. And so a big part of what I help folks do is to say, hey, 
there's there's a thousand things we can be doing, right? There's a thousand things people have told us we should be doing. Uh, how do we narrow those down to just a few things that'll actually move the business forward to where it is right now? Each one mm-hmm. of these stages builds on the the previous one. So if you try and mm-hmm. skip a stage or you don't really learn the skills of a stage or you don't actually succeed in a stage, uh, you can kind of play the the later stages. You can kind of pretend that you're in those stages, but it doesn't work very well. So with your answers, uh, uh, again, I'm going to give you the stage and then I'm going to give you kind of how aligned your answers were with each other. Mm-hmm. So the stage that you're in is stage three. This is not to be confused with the organization stage three we talked about earlier, but this is stage three mm-hmm. of your own personal journey, and it's called the reluctant manager. Uh, it's <laughs> where we're in this stage where uh, where we don't have to do it all by ourselves, but it still feels like if this thing's going to grow, it's all on our shoulders, right? Uh, you've got some folks around to kind of help out, but you don't quite have a leadership structure to help you carry it forward. Now, with that, the second thing I mentioned is we're going to look at how aligned are you with that stage. And we've got four different rankings. So spot on. So your answers were all very aligned with each other. Uh, Number two is eh, they're mostly aligned, like you're in pretty good shape. You might be feeling a little kind of distracted um, and we can dial that in. Number three is out of alignment. You're just, you're not directing all your energy in the right places. And then the last one is four and uh, that's all over the place. (laughs) And uh, unfortunately that's where you landed. Now, uh, why that is uh, a big part of why that is, is because of the dual nature of coaches. So some of those questions where you're looking at legacy, you are looking at long term, you are looking at those, those, those kind of watered down some of your answers. And again, that's kind of the nature of, of our role and of our industry, but it's also a really significant temptation for coaches. So even though that's, that's normal, it's a part of what we do, it can be a negative has a, a, a distraction for us if we're not careful. Right. So that reluctant manager one. So as you had, you laughed when I said it. Uh, just and again, it's a very brief description. But what are you hearing so far? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Um, do I feel like you're spot on? Well, I, I guess it's very difficult to kind of gauge to see what the other stages are. But I guess, yeah, in a way, the, the yeah. I mean, I don't. We definitely don't have the leadership structure in place right now. Um, but I guess. It's also kind of understanding on when does uh, you when do you need to start to create a leadership team? I suppose yes. is, is another good question, right? So that's kind of that. So um, when you said I'm kind of all over the place, uh, do I feel like I'm all over the place? Not really. Yes. Yeah. Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes and no. I think that there is def. I think that there's some. I think there's definitely some uh, some truth in what you're saying. Yeah. So here's a couple of examples uh, of what I mean by all over the place. And it doesn't mean that you're um, doesn't mean you're a bad person or anything like that. But for example, most of the success for that that either reluctant manager, if you want to put it in its its kind of natural negative light, or what I call captain on the field. Right. That that's the that's the, the kind of equivalent for this stage is you're the captain on the field. You're out there playing the game still, but you're leading others to do it as well. Most of the success for a captain on the field comes in this month's goals. Right. Uh, it, it comes in executing right now, because if you don't do it, who's going to. Right. Whereas True. oftentimes when we're looking at multi year plans, those those are are most successful when we have somebody else executing regularly on this this month's goals does that make sense mm-hmm. otherwise Agreed. they come at the expense of each other now you need both of them but you're torn between hey i want to look to the future but i've got to sell something this month uh so that that's an example of what we mean by that kind of diversified approach is that helpful got it yeah absolutely no it's very very helpful actually um i also believe though and maybe this is truth um I believe that all organizations that are at least have revenues of under seven figures are probably focused on the present, which is leads and leads and sales, right? Yes. And, and they rightfully should be. And, and so I would say in that stage, 
the the thinking a few years out is it's a helpful exercise every once in a while, right? But if you remember the question there is, hey, what's the time horizon that you make most of your important decisions? If we're doing most of our time there, that's where it starts to to diminish uh, our ability to execute in the near term. So yes. Yeah. Uh, now, you asked a, re- a really great question. That is, when do I need an executive team or a leadership team? And the answer mm-hmm. is not yet, right? Uh, and so I'm not advocating that you go out and build one of those right now. That's something for stages four and five. But to get there, to start to bridge the gap, what I've found is one of the key ingredients to success, one of the key kind of um, part of the key recipe, if you will, for this stage is to bring someone else into your your inner circle. Uh, mm-hmm. I call it the two IC, right? Uh, a, a second in command, someone who can who can kind of split the battle with with you and work side by side with you. It's not a business yeah. partner. Uh, I'm not talking about equity or anything like that, but just somebody else that you'll that you can bring in that'll help you lead it. Many times yeah. for folks, this is a a really high powered VA to start with, right? Yeah. Um, but as it starts to progress, what it allows you to do if you do this right is separate what I call defense from offense, right? Uh, it, it's exhausting trying to sell everything and then provide everything right? Or or manage everyone who's providing everything. Those two, you can only do so much of that by yourself. But if you Mm -hmm. can start to separate those two where you start to take a focus on selling, right? And growing and acquiring new clients and and marketing and podcasts and branding. and, And, but you know, someone else is carrying the baton to execute. Now this is hard for coaches, right? Because oftentimes what we sell is us. Uh, and so if, if you can start to separate those, that's one of the key ingredients to reaching mm-hmm. the next level. Now, do you have to reach the next level? No. But if you want to reach the next level, if you want to move closer and closer to that stage seven that we talked about, the legacy, uh, the, you know, the legacy piece, the visionary founder, then you'll want to start looking at uh, that, that incremental step of how do I bring in a number two? What does that look like for me? Very interesting, very interesting. As you were speaking there, because I had someone, in my, well, you know, I've had, I suppose I've got probably a good one or two people in my mind that wouldn't necessarily be good partners, or maybe, I don't know, but they would also be really good potential um right hand man or right hand yeah. woman type of thing right so kind of that's, that's kind exactly of like it. what i was thinking yeah um but that 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 is actually already in motion believe it or not <laughs> which yeah. is a really good thing that's awesome um so that's a really good thing um but yeah so and and i guess it's all about timing i guess right It is 100% about timing. That's the whole idea behind this is that uh, you didn't need a right-hand man before, right? Uh, If you're out there going to be in the star player, if you can do it all yourself, that's a lot cheaper. But but once you can start bringing somebody else in, that's the accelerator that unlocks the next stage for you. Very interesting. So here's a fascinating thing. Uh, and I want to pull in another piece. I'm not going to explain all of it. So our listeners will show you where you can find more information out about this. But another thing that you did was you took a leadership styles assessment. And and this is important because like you mentioned a skills gap uh, for for each leadership style. There's there's this myth, right? Uh, that uh, Maybe a truth gap, if you want to put it that way. There's a myth that they buy into that that limits their growth. And for folks who are visionary operator, right, that, that's your style combination. Visionary, we know what those are, big ideas, uh, creative, thinking about the future, uh, all your years to come, the legacy, that's the visionary side of you. And, and, and what every great visionary needs to build a successful enterprise is an operator, right? Someone who, who they're not thinking about all that. They just tell me what to do and I'm going to get it done right? That they will walk through walls to make it happen. And you have both of those traits. And so what that means is, uh, especially with the way that you're structured right now, you have to oscillate between those two strengths. Now, you can do that exceptionally well. Uh, and, and it's a big part of why it doesn't feel all over the place, because it both are naturally in line with with significant strengths that you have. Hmm. However, it leads to the myth that you can carry this whole thing. That, that you can do it all. 
And if you're not careful, that same thing that allowed you to do it all and create the success that's brought you this far is the very thing that will prevent you from moving forward by trying to put it all on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. I agree with that, actually. I think there's definitely a lot of truth. I am interestingly enough, we had the... Um... And uh, this is this is really interesting. We use a a, a what we call a, a behavior change personality style, kind of like this, but it's called E colors. Yep. And so one of my big colors, very predominant, very dominant red, by the way. So you'll know what that means in disc, right? So that probably correlates to what you're saying. Not that I, not that reds are bad, by the way, ladies and gents. I just want to say that, okay, all the other colors are good, okay? Just that we have our strengths and our, and we're just kind of exposing it to some of my weaknesses, which is all good. I'm kind of a little bit self-aware of that, but it's good to be reinforced with that decision. Thanks, yeah. Scott. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a helpful. So when we tie those two things together, what do you need? You need a, that effective right-hand person. Now you, you've already tuned into this kind of intuitively. And the reason why I say it's not a partner is what do you think the normal wiring is of someone who wants to be a partner in a business uh, of your two visionary and operator? What do you think would be most likely to come in? Well, I think, <sighs> And again, if, if if I was thinking, oh, business partner, that means I've got to give away equity. I don't want to give everything away type thing. That's kind of like what most Reds would be thinking. Right. Well, that, you know, but then you're just saying that actually, well, you don't necessarily have to promote them as a business partner as such. Right. You could just come to some sort of other agreement, if you like. That's exactly right. And I think you'd actually have more trouble with someone who wanted to be a business partner than if you had someone who just wanted to work side by side with you. Mm -hmm. Because most folks that would be looking for that partnership thing, thinking that far down the road are going to have a visionary style and you've already got that, right? Please. You don't need another visionary early on. You need an operator. You actually need lots of operators. That, that's, the, that's really the recipe moving forward. And so most operators, if they just have a strong vision to pursue and the freedom to do it, and they get compensated well, and they know whether or not they're winning, that's about it right? That, that's what they need. And, and they will, that, that's their sweet spot. It's not selling them short. It's, it's giving them exactly what they need to succeed. And so that, that right-hand man thing that you're looking for, you're intuitively picking up on, they're probably operators. They're probably strong operators. And if you can get the visionary operator combination working between two different people, it's five, 10, 15 times more powerful than doing it as one person yourself. I got a question. Here's an interesting thought here. Um, when it comes to operators, would if you're say you're trying to choose your ideal operator, say, say for those for those of you that are listening, in, by the way, you might be where I where 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 you're at right now. Okay, where I'm at. So when it comes to operator, what tr like you'll know, like for example, I know what my traits are, my strengths, and my weaknesses are. Should you choose an operator that has completely the polar opposite in terms of like the weaknesses of the business? For example, like um, analytics and data, for example, or risk management or creativity or whatever it is, right? Would you choose someone that has completely the polar opposite personalities? So – uh, operator and visionary are two of the four styles. And those three things that you listed off, um, data and analytics, risk management and creativity, none of those three are operator traits, right? So uh, the first two are what we call processor traits. And the last one is actually another visionary trait. So uh, no, and this is a huge challenge at this stage is because we, we realize I'm not trying to hire me right? Because that would be chaos, right? If everyone was wired just like you, that, that, that would not be pretty. Uh, and you'd probably create a lot of competitors if you're honest. So it, you're not trying to hire me. So then the next thing is, do I hire the opposite of me, right? Do I hire people who are risk averse, very detail oriented systems thinkers? And the answer is unequivocally, no, that, that, that's actually not who you're looking for. And it's a really common misconception. Uh, see, what happens is, it's difficult, especially from the outside or the first time you meet someone to tell if they are an operator or a processor, 
because mm-hmm. they're both more detail oriented than you as a founder. They're both uh, more task oriented. Uh, they're both more okay with being told what to do. But processors think in terms of system and process. Processors are those folks that you ask them what to do and they ask 18 questions in return, right? Uh, operators, you ask them what to do or you ask them to go do something and they're like, when do you need it done? You know, exactly. or you know, <laughs> where is it? You know, that, so you might get one or two questions back, which is probably one or two questions more than you want to answer, but you can stand that. So you you don't want to go out and find folks that are processors, right? You, the data and analytics stuff will come. There is a time and season for that, but it's not in a small business that you're looking to scale up rapidly. Instead, what you want to do, and we have a free assessment on our website that can help you slice through this. So at, you can take it as many times as you want. As many people can take it as they want. Um, but uh, you want to find folks who have that operator style, uh, not just folks who get stuff done, but folks who get stuff done that are operators, because what you'll find is they are naturally in alignment with what you need right now. Right. So basically what you're saying is put together a, li- a stop doing list, find out who's very, very good at what you're, what you're taking on most of your time and yeah. delegate the hell out of it and then focus on the stuff that you enjoy doing, right? Uh, yeah. And I would say that someone's got to be an operator, right? That would be the only, uh, and here, here's why, uh, because what happens when you get a visionary with a group of operators that unlocks the second stage of the organizational life cycle that is called fun, right? And, and the degree to which the fun stage is fun, I have found in working with lots and lots of organizations, the degree to which fun is fun is the degree to which you have hired and retained high quality operators. Right. It, it really boils down to that one thing. And so mm. if you could hear anything in this, it's that you don't want to continue being the visionary and operator yourself, right? That's the first thing. And to do that, you've got to go out and find other operators. And once you do, it's going to unlock a whole lot of growth very quickly. Now, are there any resources for some of our listeners that are looking to potentially say, okay, well, I hear what you're saying, Scott. I need to go find some operators, what do I need to look for in those operators? Is there is there a is there a resource that you would uh, direct people to? Yes. So uh, there's two things. One is uh, like I mentioned earlier, the assessment. Just have them take the test. Uh, it's a super super easy. If it comes back with an operator score, you know you're close, right? You don't know that it's a guarantee, but you you've got a good working. If it comes back and it's not an op- an operator. You've got some questions to ask. It doesn't mean that you don't hire them. It doesn't mean you don't talk to them. But you just want to know. Are these folks going to get it done no matter what, right? Are, are, do these folks have the drive and they're not going to leave until it's done for the day? Mm-hmm. So that's the first one. Just use the assessment. Uh, there's a book on the topic. It's a real easy read. Uh, there's an audio version of it. It's called Do Lead. Um, Do Lead. And it talks about all four of these styles. It's very, very effective. And uh, then last but not least, if you, you go on our site, you can find it. But there's a, uh, a course that we have on how to lead operators, Because this is the really big thing. If you hire a bunch of operators, but then you try to manage them like you want to be managed, you will be exceptionally frustrated. But if you learn the two or three simple things that they need to be managed well, that's what's going to do it. Love it. Love it. Very interesting. Very fascinating conversation this is, this is ladies and gents. And and the resources that you've referred to, we'll put them down below, won't we, in the description notes, right? That's right. You can find all of it at scalearchitects.com, but we'll make it simple and we'll give you a, a link to, directly to each one. There you go. You see, ladies and gents, we're here to help, you see. Anyway, um, I know we're coming towards the end of our conversation. This has been really fascinating. I just want to say that, Scott. Thank you so much. It's been really, really useful. Um. Going back to my question, my last question that I had for you, which is the whole kind of like, what was it when you, when you sold your business or when you're in the middle of operating your business, if you like, what was the hardest thing that you ever had to be faced with and why was it so difficult for you? I think the hardest things are always people things, right? Uh, And and for the sake of those people, I don't know that I, I want to share too much about those. But when when you're working in an organization and, and you've achieved a ton of success together and you can see the future and 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 they can't. Right. Or 
or it's just not the right future for them, that's a really, really tough call. And if you don't have a way of measuring that objectively or someone who can share in that process with you, that's really, really hard to do right and have the confidence that you did it right. So I would say when it comes time to picking, um, assessing, even replacing leaders, all of the very hardest decisions were that. One that's a little bit more concrete for folks, uh, and, and I see this a lot, especially in the, these, the later stages, is what are you willing to let go of to create the space for success in the next level? Uh, there was a, a, a product line that we ran. It was actually uh, events that we did all across the country. They brought in about a million and a half dollars of revenue in a $7 million company. It's a, it's a lot, right? Like you don't replace that overnight. <laughs> wow. And and while they were bringing in about a million and a half, they were taking about 40% of our time. Oh, wow. And, and they weren't growing. We didn't know COVID was coming, but they'd have been dead in a couple of years anyway, right? Uh, and so the hardest decision, if I look at it in just kind of a practical, non-relational sense, was – are we willing to say no to revenue, right? Like a lot, a lot of revenue uh, relative to the size of our organization so that we can say, have a, a more clear and concise yes in what we know is the future for our revenue and our profitability as an organization. That's a tough thing to do, closing down a million and a half dollar product line. Definitely. Wow, that's definitely one to swallow. Um, listen, I, 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 I guess my last question to you is, you know, first of all, this has been such a jam. I've been, I've had, I've had so much fun with you. It's been super, ex and it's been super detailed. I, I, I don't know about you guys that are listening in, but it's been a, a real eye opener, not just for me, but also for hopefully the you guys. You're gonna find some of the um, the chords to our conversation has really hit a note with you. And if you are kind of you know, stuck or you're looking for some answers or you're kind of in that kind of realm of being frustrated and you've hit a ceiling, you know, and you're just not sure, what I would endorse you to do is check out some of the resources that Scott has recommended in the show description notes. Anyway, before you go, what are you working on right now? Like, you know, I mean, you've sold your business right before the age of 35. You're doing scale architects and stuff like that. Like, what are you working on right now? What is it that you, uh, what, I can't say what's your legacy. Cause I guess, I guess we all have a, a slightly different thing, but what could you go? I mean, you could have retired on a freaking beach in Hawaii with a pina colada. What the hell? I'd have been bored out of my mind. Remember when I said golfing isn't enough. Uh, I'm a terrible golfer. Uh, no, I, I love, I love working on organizations. And so as a coach consultant, I get to spend the vast majority of the time working on them and not in them, which is just an absolute delight. Uh, the project I'm most excited about is the book that, that came out just last fall uh, in, in September. Mm. Uh, we released it. It's called The Founder's Evolution. Uh, it mm. maps out, like you mentioned at the, the top of the show, all seven stages that organizations go through. I'm sorry, that that founders go through. Yep. And, and what it does, uh, and it's only 60, 70 pages. I intentionally made it very short, but for each awesome. stage, it gives two or three specific, uh, I call them essential strategies, essential strategies that you need to do. And by virtue of knowing what to do, that means there's about 20 or 30, 30 things that you don't have to do. So folks, uh, write me back after reading it all the time. It's really fun. And uh, it's pretty normal for folks to save 5, 10, 15 hours every single week right out of the gate by recognizing, oh, I've been doing all these things that are good or that someone told me I should do and they're not necessary. And by cutting those, they're creating the room and space for the things that are actually are necessary and their businesses are growing like wildfire because of it. Love it, love it, love it. Well, guys, make sure that you go check out, check that out. Uh, again, we'll lead the, uh, we'll put the show description notes below and any links relevant to the conversation. Scott, this has been a great show. I just want to say thank you so much. Yeah, Adam, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. All right, guys, listen, hope you've enjoyed today's show. Please do me a favor if you have enjoyed today's show and uh, feel free to leave a one or a five star review on Apple or Spotify, of course, and uh, make sure that you go and connect with Scott either on LinkedIn or any other social media channel, which is out there as well. So um, from me and Scott, thanks so much. And hopefully we'll see you soon. Take care.
Bye bye. Thanks for listening to the Business Strategist with Adam Strong. Follow Adam on LinkedIn, YouTube, and AdamStrong.net. Leave a review on Apple or Spotify. 